Uh, eight years at the top of the BBC, uh, Thompson followed by being appointed as CEO of the New York Times, and he's been living in the US ever since. He was back in London recently, and he came in to discuss his new book, Enough Said. In it, Mark Thompson claims that the language we use is central to everything that is going wrong in modern politics. It's my view that although there never was a Garden of Eden, there was never a perfect moment, that a number of things have happened, essentially disruption in politics at the breakup of, of the, the kind of monopoly of the, the big parties, yeah. disruption of media, the accelerating effect of media and the accelerating effect of digital social media in particular. All of these things taken together, I think, are producing something which I do think of as a crisis. So it's basically short sound bites, language that is too crude, too aggressive, yeah. is stopping people watching and the rest of us from thinking properly about the big political issues ahead of us. That's a big part of it. I think also the way in which we're, we're struggling now to figure out the authority which e expertise uh, brings. This country has had enough of experts, Michael Gove told Michael us. Gove's, I think Michael Gove's statement was very telling. Yeah, the, the, the people, people have had enough of experts. Um, modern government is built on technocracy, it's built on expertise, and it's a very big step to say, though I'm sure Gove is onto something, that many people have simply stopped listening to experts. So let's talk some examples here. We had, on the one hand, we had the Prime Minister saying that leaving the EU would put a bomb under the economy, <laughs> and the Chancellor saying that we'd have an austerity budget and a very, very tough time to come. Really, it was going to be the, the, the plagues of Egypt visited yeah. on Britain if we dared to leave the EU. And on the other side, we had people like Michael Gove and Boris Johnson talking about £350 million a week coming into the That's NHS. Right. Now, all of that was probably wrong. Well, uh, certainly wild exaggeration and presenting possibilities as if they were certainties. Um, I thought overall, um, I thought the Brexit side, I thought um, uh, take back control and Independence Day um, represented the kind of victory on the Brexit side. They found pithy, clear benefits the, you could encapsulate in a few words. But isn't that just good politics, framing your argument, sure. finding the phrase and ramming it home? Sure, but I think, you know, um, in, in, in previous generations, they weren't the whole of it. Um, uh, there was a time when newspapers printed extensive extracts from political speeches. Uh, when I started at the BBC, um, yes, there'd be the headline, um, the ladies not for turning, but beneath the headline, there'll be two or three other extracts and precy of what else Margaret Thatcher said in that case to the Conservative Party. And what's happened is it's concentrated, in, in my view, down so that in, what all many voters hear is just these few phrases. Do you think the BBC is partly culpable? Well, I certainly, be I certainly believe, um, and what's troubling about what's happened is, despite the BBC, and despite this extraordinarily large uh, journalistic organisation, I think we are getting into trouble in the UK in the way we talk and debate about language. So the BBC hasn't done enough. I think it's very hard. I think there are immense forces at play on politics and media. Um, at its best, I think the BBC does try very, very hard to bring context and explanation to the way it does journalism. And one of the reasons for having a really strong, powerful, broad BBC is to make sure that the national debate really happens effectively. And of course, referendums change things completely because here on the newspaper review and all the rest, we had to balance Brexit versus non-Brexit in every case. Uh, so a referendum pre present, I think, very difficult, possibly even under the current rules, insuperable problems for broadcasters. You have two imaginary parties. Uh, they're temporary. They're going to cease. Out, yeah. They're in and out. They're going to cease to exist the day the, the vote happens. And yet you've got to treat them as if they are exactly equally balanced in the in the polls. And in a sense, if if one side you know produces an eminent you know um, uh, economist and the other side produces you know Coco the clown, they're sort of treated as if they're somehow equal. So I think there may be a case for looking at the rules for how referenda are, are covered in, in broadcasting. OK, because this is the first time we've had a chance to talk since yeah. the biggest scandal that hit the BBC, I think yeah. probably ever, yeah. the Jimmy Savile scandal. Yeah. Now, yeah. you were clear at the time that you knew nothing about the sexual allegations yeah. against him. Yeah. But given that BBC people were investigating them and did know about them, was it right that the, the guy at the top of the organisation, the Director General, didn't know? Um, the, the, the normal um, um, routine um, when I was uh, Director General, I'm sure still today, would be that, that every um, investigation um, that, that's underway, which is likely to be serious, would be written and there was a, mm. there was a system uh, uh, for, for, for getting it up, so I would know about it and I think I knew about virtually all of them. 
I wasn't, as it happens, informed about, about this one. So uh, Helen, and, and I think should have been. Helen Bowden, who was head of news at the time, does say that she yeah. did tell you. Well, the, 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 uh, I think it's, mm. it's absolutely common ground that the, the formal way of doing it um, uh, did not happen. And certainly I knew absolutely nothing, about, even about the existence of an investigation, until some time after the decision had been taken to stop the investigation. But I think I should have been told, yes. Do you look back on that episode as, as a low moment? Well, I think that it's clearly a matter of great regret mm. that Newsnight had... Uh, it's a terrible story, but it's an incredibly important story in the public interest mm. to, be to, to be told, that they had the information. And, and the, but the, in the end, I mean, I understand, I absolutely believe, as Nick Pollard said in his inquiry, that it was done again in good faith, that, that the editor decided not to proceed with that investigation. That's a matter of, of great, great regret. And behind that, obviously, the terrible things Jimmy Savile did in relation to his BBC employment and many other public organisations is, I think, one of the most shocking stories I've ever heard. We have a new governance, of course, for the BBC now, a new organisation and take over from the BBC Trust and about almost half the people on that are going to be appointed by the government of the day. Are you happy about that? I, I, I think it's not desirable that the majority of people in what's essentially going to be the t key decision-making body of the organisation, with editorial decisions inevitably coming up, that the majority should be only appointed by, by the government. And I hope that over the coming weeks... Um, a way will be found. I mean, the, there are many ways in which you, you could have the government nominating, but the independent directors uh, approving uh, uh, nominations. You could have joint, uh, joint appointments. There are lots of ways it could be solved. I don't think the British public want the BBC to be a government-controlled organisation. Now, I'm not suggesting that's what the government has in mind, but I think the more think the, more the public... The remember, we're talking about a moment where the public at large are really suspicious of elites... It's really important that the government uh, governance uh, arrangements for the BBC pass the sniff test.